talking season has come and gone. But the biggest news that came out of SEC media days had nothing to do with what one coach said about another team or anything that one player said about another player, but instead had to do with a story that came out of the Houston Chronicle that said that Oklahoma and Texas were looking to move to the SEC. That storyline, of course, dominated all the coverage of SEC Media Days and many coaches expecting to answer questions about their teams and about their players and about name, image, and likeness. Instead, were asked questions about the possibility of Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC to create a mega conference. Well, we've got all that and more today on Southeastern Style. I'm Carson Horn. We're going to talk about Oklahoma and Texas, and then we're going to move into some takeaways from what each coach said at SEC Media Days. We're going to have to make it brief in order to get through all 14 teams in the SEC, but I'm really looking forward to this episode. It's an action-packed episode. We've got a lot of things to discuss. And originally, of course, I was just going to do takeaways from each coach. But, of course, we got to talk about Oklahoma and Texas. So let's start with that. Talking season is now over for coaches, but not necessarily for us. And so Oklahoma and Texas, when this news broke, I will say I was shocked. I, I think there were some that weren't necessarily, but I'm not a college football insider. So I was shocked by this. I didn't understand it at first. I was like, well, this just doesn't make sense until you look at it from a money perspective, which is what's driving this. From the, the amount of money that Oklahoma and Texas would be able to bring in, it would astronomically increase if they were to join the SEC, because that's really the only logical reasoning for them doing it. Look, I'm looking at this from a football perspective. I think that everyone's looking at this from a football perspective. I think even Oklahoma and Texas are looking at this from a football pers perspective. How this would affect basketball and uh, you know baseball, softball, whatever sports you want to name, I don't know, but I'm looking at it from a football pers perspective right now. Later on, may look at it in a, in a more in-depth perspective, but I think this is inevitable. I think it's happening based on what I've read based on what I've heard from others. I think how soon, I don't know, but I think like the 12-team playoff, it's on track to happen, and it would take a, a big shift for it to not happen. I know there's some people, you know, discussing, well, you know, the, it has to have the approval of the majority of teams in the SEC. Well, have that. Well, I don't think you would have gotten to this stage if it didn't have the approval of the majority of SEC schools. So I believe this is happening but just thinking of this from perspective of Oklahoma and Texas, why would you want to move here? Again, it all has to do with money. Because from perspective of football, Oklahoma, in a football sense, they can continue to dominate the Big 12, not have to play the gauntlet of the schedule SEC teams have to play, and continue to make it to the college football playoff and have a chance to win national championships and not have to worry about Alabama, Georgia, Florida, LSU, Texas A&M every year. And from Texas' perspective, they're not even the top dog in the Big 12 now. So you're telling me they want to come in and they want to play this SEC schedule? Look, I know Steve Sarkeesian's there. I think he's going to do a great job. But just looking at perspective of where Texas is right now, they're not ready to be in the SEC. But again, this is down the road. They may get there. But from that perspective, it makes zero sense for those two schools to move into the SEC. Money is the reason, though. Money is the driving factor of every decision that's been made in college football over these last uh, few years. So look, college football is changing. It's changing fast. It's changing drastically. And I feel like I've been getting overwhelmed. I think a lot of college football fans have gotten overwhelmed with name, image, and likeness, the transfer portal. And now you're getting this news breaking. I think people are a little bit scared, and I think that's fair because they don't know where the college game is heading. It's change, and change is not necessarily a bad thing, but when we don't know the outcome, it makes us very, very nervous, and it makes us very anxious to see where college football is going, and we really don't have any control over it. So in my opinion, Oklahoma and Texas moving to the SEC looking would be bad for college football. Look, I'm an SEC guy. I'm an SEC fan. Obviously, this is an SEC podcast, and so, but... 
first and foremost, I'm a college football fan and I love college football. And I think this could have a detrimental effect on college football. Unless you buy into the conspiracy theory that a lot of put out there that this is just moving us one step closer to these power conferences moving away from the NCAA and, you know, and leaving the NCAA. Now, if that's the case, okay, maybe necessarily it's not necessarily a bad thing. This is just part of a plan to eventually leave the NCAA. But we don't know that at the moment. So in general, this is bad for college football. It, SEC is already the most dominant conference in college football. It's not even close, in, in my opinion, the way that the SEC dominates. But you add two what could be, you know, again, Texas not a powerhouse program right now, but they have been in the past. Oklahoma is. You add two programs like that to the SEC, it totally shifts the balance of power in college football. The Big 12 pretty much becomes irrelevant at that point. Yes, you still got some some decent teams out there, but they become pretty much irrelevant when this happens. And then this it affects everybody. It affects the Big 10. It affects the ACC. It affects the Pac-12. These conferences now feel like, okay, maybe we've got to add teams. So overall, we don't know exactly what, again, just like with anything, we don't know what exactly the long-term effect would be. But then you're looking at, with a 12-team playoff, you're, you're going to even be more loaded with the amount of SEC teams that you would probably get into the playoffs. And I just don't like it. From I, I like the Power 5 setup we've got. I think it's a good balance of power. Yes, we've got SEC as a dominating conference. But it's not to an astronomical level that you would see if Texas and Oklahoma were to move into it. I'm not thinking of it from a fan's perspective. Oh, this will be bad for SEC. They'll just keep beating up on each other. You won't have undefeated teams. It could hurt teams making the playoffs. No, I'm not thinking of it from that, from that perspective. If anything, I think it will make the SEC um, better and put more, get more teams into the playoffs. I'm thinking of it from a balance and power standpoint in college football. This, I believe, would be detrimental to that. And then looking at it from Texas A&M perspective, I'll go ahead and address that. <laughs> I know A&M doesn't want uh, Texas and Oklahoma to join. I understand that. They get to be the, the lone SEC team in the state of Texas. That's a great recruiting tool. Obviously, if Texas were to join, that would, that would mess that up. So I understand that perspective. But I, I, I also like the perspective of you get to see a Texas-Texas A&M rivalry be renewed again. That would be fun to see. But overall, to, to summarize, because it would create such a huge shift in the balance of power of college football, I'm not a fan of Texas and Oklahoma moving to the SEC, but I do believe it is more than likely inevitable and is going to happen. I'm sure the SEC, Oklahoma, and Texas administrators, none were happy that this news leaked this week. Of course, they had the Big 12 meeting uh, last night without Texas and Oklahoma there to discuss the future. So I think this is happening. I really do. How quickly, when, I don't know yet. I'm sure more details are to come. So moving and shifting from that, shifting to go ahead and let's start with my takeaways from SEC Media Day. So i got a few general takeaways, and then we'll dive into each team individually. So my general takeaways, most coaches were similar in their responses on name, image, and likeness. Most coaches were very careful, besides uh, Nick Saban saying how much Bryce Young had made, I think maybe Dan Mullen, coaches didn't, didn't release what their, how much money their players were bringing in, but almost every coach discussed the impact of the locker room chemistry and just having to deal with that. Nick Saban was very careful, careful in his remarks, along with some other coaches, just about not wanting to say too much, because again, said we don't know what the consequences are going to be with name, image, and likeness, so I don't want to say something that really could come back and uh, bite me, you know, next year. Uh, so you want to be careful. Coaches were were careful about the way they address that. That really that's really what stood out to me. Now they mentioned it. They talked about you know building your brand. Uh, a lot of coaches did do that. So yes, they they were using the st- the stage a little bit, the podium, if you will, to recruit. Um, you know, to recruit, not supposed to with name, image, and likeness, but they were doing that. They, they would mention it, but they were careful in the way that they did. So that stood out to me from pretty much every coach. They were all very similar in the way they handled it. And then you saw a few coaches talk about transfer portal. It didn't get asked as much as I thought it would. I thought Mike Leach had the strongest stance against it. 
uh, uh, Nick Saban had a pretty strong stance against it, not necessarily big fans of it. But again, you have to be careful because you need it in recruiting now. And that's why you weren't going to hear a coach say something negative about NIL either because you have to use it in recruiting. So even if a coach isn't a fan of name, image, and likeness, they're not going to say that, which I believe a lot of coaches are probably not fans of it. But again, they're not going to say that because it could be used against them in recruiting. So let's get to each coach, each team individually. Again, going to try to make this brief in order to get through all 14 teams. Trying to make it as concise as I can. Uh, watched every coach, what they said. These are just my takeaways. So starting with Florida and Dan Mullen. Look, Dan Mullen realized this Florida defense has to improve. They were in the SEC championship game last year, but he did say he was pleased with this Florida defense's uh, attitude this offseason. He believes they will be improved next year. So he's very excited about this defense. But again, that stood out to me. He is uh, excited about the attitude of the Florida defense. The second takeaway was that he said things will be different offensively with Emory Jones. Is that a shock? No. Dan Mullen, one of the best offensive minds in college football, he has shown the ability to adapt to his quarterback from Dak Prescott to Kyle Trask. Last year, Emory Jones, let preface with this, Emory Jones is a more prototypical, in my opinion, Dan Mullen quarterback. A guy that gives you a, a more run option. Dan Mullen in the past had been a more run first offense coordinator, but last year he knew his strength was passing the football, so that's what he did. He did it very successfully, but I think he's going to return to more his bread and butter, and that's running the football, and he addressed that. So that was what stood out to me. Offense will adapt with Emory Jones at quarterback. LSU at Orgeron. The biggest thing that I think LSU fans will be excited to hear, the biggest takeaway. He said, quote, we're bringing back the Joe Brady offense of 2019. Look, LSU's got to get back on track, and this will be a big step in doing so. But, man, Ed Orgeron sounded like a different coach, sounded like a different person at the podium. That's what stood out to me. It seems like Coach O's realized that the program was drifting in a direction he didn't want to see it go, and he's made some big changes. He talked about his hiring process, of how he pretended to be a player when interviewing coaches to see – because uh, he's focusing a lot on relationships. He wants his coaches to be able to relate with the players, to be able to have good relationships with his players. So I think that's good to hear if you're an LSU fan, to see that Coach O realized the program was headed in the wrong direction. And it sounds like, at least from what he is saying, that he has made some big changes. And he feels like he's got this program turned in the right direction now. And he also, the last thing he said, he simplified the defense, hoping to improve big time on the defense side of the ball. They have way too much talent on the defense side of the ball to struggle like they did last year. So I think the team chemistry is going to be important for LSU. I think that was an issue. I think Coach O's realized that. A big uh, change of tune for Coach O this year at SEC Media Day. So we'll see if the play backs up what Coach O has said uh, so far. So, But I like what I heard. I think if you're an LSU fan, you certainly have to like what you heard from Coach O at the podium. South Carolina, man, I could go on and on about what Shane Beamer said. He was dynamic. He was energetic. He was exciting. He was a great speaker to be a, a first-time head coach and to be that comfortable in front of the media was extremely impressive, extremely poised guy. And you can tell he believes in this Gamecock program. You can tell this is where he wants to be. And you can tell he believes he can elevate this program to a high level again. Look, Steve Spurrier got the South Carolina program to a to a high level for a few seasons, got him to the SEC championship game. He believes he can get this Gamecock program back there. But he knows this team is young. He knows this team has a this program has a ways to go. He knows he's got to amp up recruiting in order to get this program where he wants it to be at. But he's a guy that you can't help but want to be successful. And I hope he, I certainly hope he is because of the type of personality. He has. He certainly seems like a coach that will be successful, but again, that's only our guess. The coach can talk really great and not be worth anything. I hope that's not the case with Shane Beamer because he seems like a very likable guy. I really like what he's selling at South Carolina. He talked about that at the podium. So that's what stood out to me, just his personality and, and his bright plans for the South Carolina program. So I'm excited to see what Shane Beamer is going to do again. Uh, South Carolina, I believe, is headed in the right direction under him. 
Georgia. Look, Kirby Smart, we know what we're going to get from him. With Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, some some others, you know what to expect from these guys, so it's hard for, for stuff to stand out. So not a ton stood out for me from Kirby Smart. He, he knows what the expectations are at this point, and his players know what the expectations are. And, and he addressed that. And the quote I really like from Kirby Smart, he said they say this a lot in the Georgia program, is he said, quote, too busy working to worry about expectations. And that's the mentality they're taking. They realize the expectations are high. They realize they're expected to be an SEC championship, national championship level team. And they're ready to, and they're ready to be there. They're tired of people um, you know, talking down, talking bad about Georgia because they haven't achieved what they want to yet. They realize the expectations. Kirby Smart realizes the expectations. Uh, he didn't talk a ton about the roster in general. He talked a little bit about JT Daniels. He's excited about him. But again, not much to say except, hey, we got to go prove it on the field. There's been enough talking. We know we're talented. We know we're a good enough team to win it all. So let's go do it. And I think that's the mentality Georgia is taking this season. And now following that, Alabama. Look, Nick Saban is Nick Saban. Everybody knows who he is. The greatest coach of all time. Again, I already talked about what he said about name, image, and likeness. The biggest thing that stood out, of course, he talked about the challenge. Uh, a reporter asked him, you know, why not leave and, and take on a different challenge? He said he thinks it's a challenge every year to be able to rebuild. And he realizes he's going to have to rebuild this offense a little bit. Only three returning starters on offense. going to have a new quarterback in Bryce Young. So that stood out to me. But I think they're going to be just fine if... This team is like any other Alabama team. They will replace their guys, and you won't, and it won't even skip a beat, and won't even miss a beat. Excuse me, <laughs> miss a beat from from last year. But what did st- uh, stand out to me the most was what Nick Saban said about his offense. We've heard this before, but he he reemphasized it. Was that this offense, the offensive philosophy, will not change under Bill O'Brien. It'll be the same offense and philosophy that has been at Alabama since Lane Kiffin came in and changed the offense. You run Nick Saban's offense when you're his offensive coordinator. You can add your wrinkles. The terminology stays the same. Formations of place, the stuff you're going to run stays the same. But again, Bill O'Brien will be able to make his adjustments, some things he might like to do. They'll play to the strength of their players. They'll play to the strength of Bryce Young. But in the end, it is Alabama's offense that Bill O'Brien will be running, not his Houston Texans offense. So that's what stood out to me from Alabama. Now, Vanderbilt, Clark Lee taking over this program. Look, I saw some people said they didn't like his media day. He's not an energetic, new new young coach type like Shane Beamer. He's a hard-nosed, old-school, down-to-business type of guy. So his address was not a high energetic, make you feel good, you know, win the press conference type of of address in SEC media days. But I liked it. I like the hard nosed approach that he's bringing to Vanderbilt, and I like the what he laid out. He laid out what he wants to do at Vanderbilt, and I appreciated that that he laid out the groundwork for what he wants to do here, uh, coming from Notre Dame's defense coordinator as a Vanderbilt. Uh, graduate as a former Vanderbilt football player. He's excited to be at Vanderbilt. You can tell that. But he, he's talking about reinventing what it means to be a Vanderbilt football player. He has big ideas, but he's having to resell what it means to be a Vanderbilt football player. There's this stigma attached to playing at Vanderbilt, and he wants to change that. He wants to advertise being able to, to play in the largest city in the SEC in Nashville, Tennessee. So I like his recruiting pitch. I hope it works for uh, for him that he can elevate this Vanderbilt program. No, Vanderbilt's not going to be able to turn into an SEC powerhouse. But I do believe they can improve and and get to a competitive level again in the SEC. And that's what Clark Lee is hoping to do. So it's going to take big ideas to change this Vanderbilt program. He's got those. Probably one of the big reasons he was hired to be the Vanderbilt football coach to reinvent the wheel, if you will, at Vanderbilt, Um, so completely reshaping and redesigning the Commodore football program. Again, not even making players earn their their jersey numbers, won't name a single starter right now. Again, a very old school, very hard-nosed approach, 
We'll see how it works out at Vanderbilt for Clark Lee. Mississippi State, we finally, finally got to see Mike Leach after last year SEC Media Days being canceled. We got to see Mike Leach at the podium answering questions, did not, um, did not give an opening statement, said he wasn't a fan of them, went right into questions. So I know reporters really uh, were appreciative of that. But besides, of course, Mike Leach being just a, a you know, funny guy, some jokes talking about uh, the Tennessee and Tennessee being interested in him a few years ago and said they had a coup, a coup there. Uh, that was funny, but but nothing, not a ton, not nothing, not a ton stood out about necessarily about his football program. Uh, he did say he was not naming a starter yet. That's probably the biggest thing uh, between Will Rogers and Jack and the transfer from Southern Miss, Jack Abraham. So Will Rogers, man, I, I have a hard time seeing him not win the job the way he played down the stretch last season. But Mike Leach talked a lot about Jack Abraham's experience, a veteran player. So that may give Jack Abraham a little bit of an advantage. Who knows? That's probably the only news that really stood out to me from the press conference. Mike Leach was funny. It was enjoyable. But there wasn't a ton of team news or, or takeaways that came out of that besides the quarterback battle. So we'll see what happens there. I really do believe Will Rogers will end up being the starter. But Mike Leach certainly did not make any promises. He did say he did not want to play two quarterbacks, which I thought was interesting because I thought he really might consider that at least early on. But that doesn't sound like what he wants to do. Now, Texas A&M. Jimbo Fisher always makes news. Uh, he's not afraid to talk a little trash. He, he, he doesn't care about that. He did that some, talking about Alabama. He has some Alabama fans riled up on social media. Um, I know that. He did get asked a question, though. Which, so that's why I wanted to preface with some context here. He did get asked the question, do you see similarities between this Texas A&M team and your Florida State team that won the national championship? He said yes, but I don't know what you're supposed to say there. Are you supposed to say no? I, I don't know. Um, but he did say yes, so I thought that was newsworthy. So that was a takeaway that I, that I took. He did say, you know, has not announced the starter between Haynes King and Zach Calzada yet. Uh, most believe it'll be Haynes King. I personally believe it'll be Haynes King. But no announcement there from Jimbo Fisher. But probably the biggest takeaway I took was that he had multiple questions about Alabama, about facing them, about playing them, about beating them, you know, what, however, however you want to spin it. So all that that tells me is that the expectations for Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M are high now. The expectation is for them to compete with Alabama. The expectation is for them to be able to beat Alabama. The expectations have risen now. And with the amount of money and the, um, and the facilities and the, the program now at Texas A&M, that should be the expectation. And Jimbo Fisher realizes that, I believe. And I believe he, he is taking that program to that level almost. They're, they're on the verge. Can they get there? I believe they can. Will they get there this year? I don't know. That was the takeaway that the expectations have risen for Texas A&M. Now, Missouri, Eli Drinkwitz was the most entertaining coach at SEC Media Days. Very funny. Started out with the joke with about the horns down being a penalty in the SEC. But he did talk a little bit about his team, made some jokes with the media. But he believes he can get Missouri back to an upper echelon SEC team. Look, this team came to the SEC and made the SEC championship game won the SEC East in 2013 and 2014, or, yeah, 2012 and 2013, some uh, in those years. And this was a Missouri team that back then was was very, very good offensively. And they've been pretty good offensively since they came into the SEC. Now people would argue the SEC East was weak when they came in, but still, they've proven they can win it. And Eli Drinkwitz believes he can get back to that level. Most people believe they overachieved last year, but he believes Missouri has still a long way to go and can still improve uh, greatly. I think he's excited about this team, and I like the direction he's taking them. He knows, again, offensive guy, but his defense has to improve, and he continues to expect that it will. The, the funniest quote, though, that came out of this from Eli Drinkwitz was, he said, I can't remember the last time Arkansas beat us. So a little, a little trash talk there, and I looked it up for Coach Drinkwitz, and it was in 2015, the last time Arkansas beat Missouri, and Eli Drinkwitz was not the coach at Missouri then. So 
he's excited, a very dynamic guy, very exciting coach, and he certainly brought a lot of entertainment to SEC Media Days. And then Arkansas, former uh, Missouri head coach Barry Odom's the defense coordinator there, and that was one of the big takeaways I took was how Sam Pittman talked about how he relies on Barry Odom, how he takes 45-minute walks with Coach Odom. Coach Odom has experience as an SEC head coach, and I think Sam Pittman relies on that. I love Sam Pittman a lot. If you followed this podcast for a long time, you remember how I discussed how I was a big fan of the hire when it happened. doesn't mean he'll, he'll end up being a great coach for Arkansas, but I like where things are headed. And I think Sam Pittman's excited about how veteran this team is. 19, 19 of 21 starters are returning. That's including 11 super seniors. So I think he believes that'll lead, give Arkansas an advantage this season, having that veteran presence. So those were the two big things that stuck out for me for Arkansas. Uh, it is believed that KJ Jefferson will be the quarterback. Talked a little bit about him. Um, but those were the two big things that stood out. Now, for Auburn, there wasn't a ton that stood out from Brian Harson here, similar to Clark Lee, I thought, in the way that he just kind of laid out what his program is, how it's going to be run, and talked for over 15 minutes, only gave, only had time for three questions. So some people in the media were frustrated about that. He did get to talk a little, you know, of course, to local media and, and things like that and get asked more questions later. But the questions he did get asked that stood out to me Multiple questions about Gus Malzahn. You know, it's an interesting dynamic that he replaced Gus Malzahn at Arkansas State. Now he replaced Gus Malzahn at Auburn. And he did, one thing was interesting, he said he did back in 2007 or 6 or whenever Gus Malzahn was at Tulsa, did go there and meet with Gus Malzahn. He said he read Gus Malzahn's book on the hurry up, no huddle offense. He said he spent about an hour and implemented some of those things into the offense at Boise State. I thought that was an interesting takeaway just the the dynamic of that relationship for Auburn fans is certainly I think something they were interested in to, to hear but I think Auburn fans like what they've been hearing from Brian Harson about where this program is headed a, a no-nonsense uh, type of coach hard-nosed type of coach but again not a lot stood out because he only you know answered three questions um, but that is uh, the future of Auburn, I believe, is going to be bright under Brian Harson. But again, that's just my opinion. Again, every coach can talk really well, and most coaches did this week. It doesn't mean the play on the field will back that up. Tennessee, Josh Heupel, he, I thought he had a very good uh, SEC media day. Um, of course, he's been the head coach at UCF. He talked a lot in his opening statement about focusing on building relationships with his players, building relationships with, with coaches and the fans. Seems like that's something very important to him, and I can understand that with the amount of turnover and turmoil that Tennessee has had. These players need to feel comfortable with Josh Heupel. They need to feel happy in this Tennessee program. So he talked a lot about that. And then the other big thing he talked about, he believes he can turn this Tennessee program around quickly, which is music to Vol fans' ears, I know. They're ready to be a contender in the SEC again, and it's been way too long. There's no excuse for it. We know that. Josh Heupel believes with his dynamic offense, he can turn things around very quickly. If they can just come close to matching the numbers that he was able to put up at Missouri and UCF and as far as points and yards per game, even if the defense struggles this year, Tennessee will be able to win some games they probably shouldn't. So, looking forward to watching this ball team this year. Josh Heupel, again, very good media days. I think he's going to do a great job at Tennessee. Now, Kentucky. First things first, I think Mark Soup's addressed this. He knows the expectations at Kentucky are higher now. That's the outward expectations from fans and media. That's the inward expectations in the program. He said his goal when he first got to Kentucky was to get Kentucky relevant on the national stage again. And he's close. He's close to doing that, but he knows he's not quite there yet. But I love what Stoops is doing. But the expectations, again, they're starting to rise. So now seven win, eight win seasons, now that you've had a 10 win season before, that's what, what fans want to start seeing. So the pressure starts to rise, but he's done an incredible job there. And the other big thing that stood out to me, which will help, I believe, Kentucky, is they're recruiting Ohio. Look, where they're located, Ohio is just north of them, 
So being able to recruit Ohio will be big when you're not having to get in battles with, with Alabama's, with Texas A&M's, with Georgia's for recruits. You're able to go up into Ohio and get some top guys. That'll be big for Kentucky to get some players uh, out of there. So that stood out to me that Mark Stoops really talked about that. Recruiting Ohio and logically, it makes a lot of sense. I didn't really think about it before until he brought it up, but it makes a lot of sense for Kentucky. And then finally, Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss. Look, Lane Kiffin's always fun to watch, always an interesting uh, guy, always makes a lot of fun comments. Talked a lot about Nick Saban, of course. He got a lot of questions about that. Uh, no surprise to him or anyone else that he did. But he did say this about Matt Krause, and Matt Krause needs to improve, needs to be more consistent. He believes he's the best quarterback in the SEC. I would tend to agree with him there. But he realizes that he can't have another six-interception game uh, this year at Ole Miss. He needs to see more consistency out of Matt Corral. The other thing that stood out, obviously, Lane Kiffin said his defense needs to improve. We all understand that. But he said he uses analytics, and he's talked about this before, but he said the analytics change by, by week, but he said, I don't make decisions, you know, just randomly. There, there's a reasoning behind them, which a lot of people would have thought Lane Kiffin probably makes decisions just because he wants to, but no, so there's a lot of analytics that goes go behind going forward on fourth down or kicking that field goal or, you know, what, whatever it might be. There's a lot of reasoning behind that. I thought that was interesting. Analytics are becoming more a part of the of sports in general and not just football, but in other sports as well. Different coaches have different opinions on it, and I think some of your new age coaches like it a little bit more than your old school. It's a personal opinion. Whew. That was a lot to go through. Um, again, I tried to make it as brief as possible for the recap of each team, but I wanted to, to give takeaways of each team. But man, I'm excited. Media Days is always a lot of fun, but talking season, as I said, it's over now. Fall camp is right around the corner, corner, and then the season will be here very, very soon. I cannot wait. Again, we'll be able to slow it down a little bit, not have to talk about all 14 teams in one episode here coming soon. We'll be able to break it down, spend more time on each team individually, and to discuss in episodes to come soon as we as fall camp takes off for most of these schools and as we approach the season. So I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you all enjoy Media Days. Thank you all for tuning in and watching or listening south, to Southeastern Style today.